the Amityville horror was true, wasn't it? When it comes to Amityville, we have many assertions, a few checked facts and uh, a lot of opinions. But which is which? Which is true? Let's try to find out. The Amityville story broke to the wider public in 1977 via J. Hansen's book, The Amityville Horror. I read that book and it scared me witless. Since then, there have been movies in 1979, 2005, and a series of further books on the subject. There was a 2012 film called My Amityville Horror, which featured paranormal investigator Lorraine Warren telling what had happened to her at the house. The Amityville story has certain distinct elements. Think of them maybe like a five-act structure in a play. Here they are. Act 1. The murders that took place at the house in November 1974, committed by Ronald DeFeo Jr., also known as Butch. Act 2. The claims of poltergeist activity made by the Lutz family after they moved in and stayed for one month only in December 1975, pretty much exactly one year after the DeFeo murders. Act 3. The frenzy over the Amityville horror book that came out in September 1977. This book supported the claims the Lutzes had suffered from real paranormal terrorization. Act 4. The aftermath, including investigations into the demonic activity carried out by such people as the Warrens, and then the upsurges in the frenzy as each new book and film got released, and finally the attempts to debunk the claims of the supernatural happenings in countless articles, subreddits and TV documentaries. All good stories have themes, and it seems to me that the theme of the whole Amityville horror escapade is lies. Because each part of the story, as we set out above, all those five parts are riddled with lies. And it's a real effort to try and disentangle which bits of each of those is true and which is a lie. Of course, some are easier than others. If the Amityville demons are real, then that is pretty scary. And I thought it was true when I read the Amityville horror as a young teen in the 1970s, and I was pretty scared, and that's an underestimate. But in my opinion, apart from the scare factor, the second major draw of the Amityville story is a human attempt to find out who's lying and who's telling the truth. Looking at each of those sequences of the Amityville story in turn, we see that DeFeo's account of the murder of his family is filled with claims that seem to be obvious lies. The Lutz's account after that a year later, the demonic activity in the house has been attacked as being lies. And then, in regards of the paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren, are either championed by the believers as heroes of the light, bringing salvation to the darkness, or condemned as despicable frauds. Because of the sheer amount of claims about what went on, many of them contradictory, it is really an enormous job to sift and disentangle the truth from lie, but let's try. First of all, the house itself, the Amityville Horror House. And even the house isn't what it's claimed to be. The real-life Amityville Horror residence can be found in Amityville, New York, at 112 Ocean Avenue on Long Island. It used to be 112. It's not even that anymore. It's now 108 and one of the house's later owners altered the address to 108 Ocean Avenue to deter rubberneckers and gawkers from just stopping by and standing in the lawn, presumably with a picnic looking in their windows. The house's distinctive eye windows as seen in the movie have been replaced. It doesn't look like that anymore. And contrary to what they imply in the film, the house was not built in 1692, tying it to some kind of witch craze period, but it was built in 1927. And the 1979 movie claimed about the house that there was a secret red room that the Lutzes didn't really know about, and that this was the focus of the poltergeist manifestation and the evil. And, and it says, the film claims, that the Lutzes knew nothing about this room. But Patty Comarato, who was a childhood friend with the murdered Alison DeFeo, used to play in the house 
And she says there was indeed a room in the basement and that, rather than evil, the red room, as it was called, seems to have been a small storage space under the stairs where the DeFeos stored kids' toys. And this Dutch colonial residence is now a valuable asset. The house has five bedrooms, three and a half baths, a boathouse on a canal off the Long Island Sound. And the Lutzes bought the house in 1975 for $80,000. They sold it for less than that. This was a knockdown price when they bought it as well. Because, remember, the house had been the scene of a terrible mass murder only 13 months before. It's changed hands a couple of times since then. In 2017, it was sold for $605,000, which was $200,000 less than what they originally asked for. So that's the house. Let's have a look. And we see that the house, despite all the various claims about it, is has not been... They've even lied about the house, basically. The next thing is the Ronald DeFeo murders. So Ronald, so-called Butch DeFeo Jr., the eldest son, he used a .35 caliber Marlin rifle to murder his parents, his two brothers and sisters, and two sisters. In the early hours of November 13th, 1974, he was 23 years old. Evidence reveals that his mother and his 13-year-old sister Alison were awake when he turned his gun on them. He didn't even kill them when they were sleeping. After shooting the others while they were sleeping, he took a shower, very coolly, left the house. He went to work as usual that day, and he admitted he took a bath and changed his clothes, and he threw away his rifle, his bloody clothes, and a pillowcase down a storm drain in a Brooklyn suburb. When this Ronald DeFeo Jr. finally admitted his crimes to the police, describing what he'd done, he said, Once I started, I just couldn't stop. So he went to work as normal. He went to work as normal, and after he left work, Ronald DeFeo went then to Henry's Bar in Amityville. And while he was there, he claimed he tried to contact his home repeatedly, but to no avail. And he made sure that the customers in the bar knew that he was worried about his parents. Then he left the bar and he came back about 6.30 p.m. yelling, you got to help me, I think my mother and father are being shot. And a group of customers from the bar went back with him to the house and there as his witnesses, sure enough, they found his murdered family. Forensic revealed that the DeFeos were murdered about 3 a.m. There were no local reports of gunshots, but the barking of the DeFeo dog had been heard. And then... When he became a suspect, Ronald DeFeo Jr. repeatedly changed his alibi, saying he was at the bar when the murders took place. That was the first one. And then a bizarre story that he'd been forced to watch mob hitman Louis Fellini kill his family. And the rumour went about, or perhaps by him, that the DeFeo family were connected with the mob and that he owned the gangster's money, the father, and that this was a hit. And this story was quickly shown to be false because the alleged hitman wasn't even present in New York at the time of the killings. I wonder how that went down if DeFeo hadn't been actually arrested. I wonder if the, uh, this hitman would have had a quiet word with him. Ronald DeFeo Jr., then after the hitman story fell apart, claimed that he had voices in his head telling him to kill his family. And this was the insanity defence. But he didn't even stick to that because that fell apart and it became clear that that was just made up. But this story about him hearing voices has, has remained in the public imagination because it kind of links to the Lutz's later claims about demonic forces in the house. So then, after he'd admitted it, DeFeo says he excuses his crime by saying he murdered his parents because they were violent to him. And this version of the story emphasises the boy's traumatic background, which included an aggressive father and a passive mother who didn't protect him. And that led him to become, you know, have substance abuse problems as an adult. But we also know that Roland DeFeo had a history of not only aggressively confronting his father, but also, even before he shot him, brandishing a gun at him. And in contradiction to reports of his parents' apparent wickedness towards him, we actually hear that they gave him money every week because he, he struggled to have a job and allowed him to live with them when others would have expected a, their adult son to be fending for himself. Ronald DeFeo Jr. was in and out of work. He also admitted at the time of the murder he'd been intoxicated and high on heroin. So to me, he sounds like a deadbeat. And despite the blizzard of excuses and alibis, within a day, 
after all of these, you know, basically hard to believe stories, he was found guilty on all six counts of second degree murder after he admitted the day after the killing. It took him 12 days from the murder for him to be convicted and be given a life sentence of 25 years in prison. By that, it seems he should have got out in 1999, but he was still in prison uh, in 2021 when he died, age 69. Interestingly, they've never released the cause of death, but I don't think that necessarily means it's suspicious. There were some stories that there must have been somebody else involved because more than one person had to commit the crime, but nobody else was ever nailed for it. So it seems to me that Ronald DeFeo Jr., Butch, was a bitter young man. He was a failure at life. And it turned his resentment and anger on his parents, who appear for their, to their credit to have done what they could to support him and help him turn his life around. But he wasn't ready to take responsibility. He just blamed other people. And actually, this is a very sad thing we see time and time again with these young men murderers. You know, they're, they're ultimately, they, they feel pathetic and they're full of rage and they turn their anger on, on innocent people, really. Yep, so he blamed all sorts, mafia, voices in his head, and the victims himself, but he didn't mention any supernatural forces. And that came later, apparently, apparently with the connivance of his attorney, which is hard to believe, but that's the story. So the next act of the Amityville story is the Lutz family. The Lutz family enter the Amityville house. So there had been some appalling murders at the house, But the Amityville Horror House's reported haunting didn't begin. So the haunting didn't begin until the Lutz family moved in there in December 75, which was a year after the murders. George and Kathy Lutz thought their 80,000 purchase of the 4,000 square foot home was a great deal. And there may be various motivations to buy such a house, a knockdown price. But it's also said that George Lutz had an interest in black magic. So was it this morbid fascination with the dark side that drew George Lutz to buy the house? His wife, Kathy, had children to a previous husband, Sebastian Quarantino, and Sebastian Quarantino continued to see his kids through the period. One of Sebastian's children, Christopher, described his stepfather, George Lutz, as a professional showman. And, he, and it, it, the, being professional means you get paid for your work, doesn't it? And he kind of got paid for his theatrics. Anyway, so Christopher Quarantino clashed with Lutz many times before he left home, age 16. And of the whole Amityville thing, he, Quarantino said, I just feel like being exploited. Quarantino, for his part, says he remembers some weird things at the Amityville house, such as windows banging open and shut on their own and a menacing shadow figure appearing in his bedroom. But he doesn't remember any of the other more theatrical stuff that George Lutz spoke about. Quarantino feels and has gone on record to say that it was grossly exaggerated. And then his stepfather, George Lutz, sued him for going public with the denial of the weird goings on at the Amityville house. There was lots of suing went on, and I guess that happens when there's a lot of money to be made. Lawyers come round like flies and uh, lots of litigation happens. So we know that George Lutz was interested in black magic and the story goes that he tried to summon spirits in the past. We know he was theatrical, a showman, and he had money worries. So remember all those things as I tell you what happened next. So apparently the Lutzes had a priest bless the home on the day they moved in. The day they moved in. George said that when the priest was in the sewing room, the holy man felt an invisible hand hit him. And the priest heard a voice. Get out! So we went. But like most things about this story, it's disputed. For example, did the priest visit at all? Was it on the first day or a while later? Did he hear a voice and was he slapped? Each one of these things is argued over and it struck me as odd that you should have a priest come and exercise your house as soon as you move in. Was it because that Lutz was deeply religious or superstitious by nature, or was he laying the groundwork for a future claim that the Amityville house was going to be a place of demonic horror? Pretty soon after they moved in, the Lutz family described seeing lots of weird stuff. When the house was supposed to be vacant, they saw figures moving about, slime oozing out of the walls, cutlery flying off kitchen surfaces, 
doors being pulled off their hinges, cabinets slamming shut, demonic red eyes belonging to a pig-like creature peering round corners. That's a bad one. More slime pouring from the ceilings. It seems there was lots of slime. George claimed his wife changed into an elderly woman. I suppose if he waited long enough. George said that his wife could levitate above the bed. That's a bit more unusual. Evil forces began arranging the furniture, much of which was left over from the defeos. Odd welts appeared on Kathy's body. Cloven hoof prints were seen in the snow. And then George claims that he was awakened every morning at 3.15am, the precise time that Ronald DeFeo murdered his family. Even though he heard his children's mattresses smashing up and down on the floor one night, he couldn't get up to save them, he said, because an invisible force held him paralysed. All in all, it was a fairly unsettling month, with Kathy apparently levitating in bed, green slime allegedly pouring from the walls, and eyes staring to the house from the outside. And after 28 days, the family left, leaving behind their belongings, including the food in the refrigerator and clothing in the closets. During all the myths that grew up about the Amityville horror, there was the story that George Lutz killed his dog, Harry. The dog, which was kept in a pen behind the house, went berserk once and attempted to scale the fence. Daniel Lutz, the family's son, relates all this in the 2012 documentary, My Amityville Horror. Daniel Lutz said that because the dog's chain was short, it was left hanging over the fence by its neck, preventing its paws from touching the ground. The dog was about to hang itself when Daniel arrived and saved it. But going along with the supernatural narrative, Daniel says he thought that the poltergeist that frequented their boathouse had startled the dog. But despite this, even the contentious book The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson never claimed that the dog had been killed or that George had even attempted to, to hurt it. It was a half-breed Malamute. Two months, just two months after the Lutzes fled the house, a local TV crew conducted a piece on the home and invited supposed ghost hunters and supernatural investigators to assess the couple's allegations. George had made it, if that's what he was after. And remember, this was after The Exorcist came out, the film The Exorcist came out in 1972. So the whole world was primed for supernatural stories and like the Amityville horror, The Exorcist was supposedly based on a, a true story, a true exorcism, and that was part of the horror that it generated. Even though that Peter William Blatty, I don't think, um, claimed, he used a, a, an exorcism as the basis for it, but he didn't say that the story was true. But there was definitely that thing about saying, oh yeah, this is true, that really scared people. And in that part of the 70s, and George Lutz would have known this, there was a lot of money to be made from these claims. So, in conclusion, I think that George Lutz was theatrical by nature, that he had an interest in the paranormal and that he had money worries and that he was not committed to the truth when there was a buck to be made. But as well as this, we know how stories go. Consider the Salem witch trials where the claims were pure baloney. One histrionic person makes a claim and then it grows like a fever and people are making more and more outrageous statements about weird stuff going on. Interestingly, they may even know it's false, but at the same time they feel it's true. So you have two systems, you're thinking and you're feeling, and they're often out of kilter with each other. This is called cognitive dissonance, or as Orwell said, doublethink. And I suspect that George Lutz was deep in the doublethink. He knew he was a con man and that he was making things up, but on another level, it felt like it was true. And I suppose this is the explanation why the family abandoned their house after only 28 days after they moved in. Lutz knew it was fake, but he also believed it was real, and his own imagination scared him to death, and of course he wouldn't be the first person that that happened to. So, the priest in the Amityville Horror. There are contradictory claims about the priest. On the one hand, he's said to have been chased from the house, as we heard, the first day they moved in, or he came a little while later when demonic things started happening. The investigative television programme In Search Of aired an episode on October 4th, 1979, following the premiere of the popular 1979 film. So Amityville Horror came up and down in popularity and was fanned by each episode and each movie and each documentary that came out, each book that came out. But in, in search of, 
in 79, they claim to have spoken with the real Amityville horror priest and got the lowdown. So according to the program, the priest said the Lutzes invited him to the house to bless it after informing him that the DeFeo killings occurred there. According to that story, he visited the family on the day they moved in, and this is what's claimed in the 1979 film. But in another version, it said he didn't arrive until they'd already been living there a few weeks. In this 1979 uh, interview, the actual priest from Amityville hid his identity. That would have added to the drama and the mystery of it. And during the recording, it, in the 79 film, if you've seen it, um, Philip Baker Hall is the actor who plays the priest, and he gets mobbed by the flies in the Amityville house. Uh, and he said, the priest said that didn't actually happen. But, you know, that's an impressive effect, and you can't actually blame the director of the 79 film, uh, Stuart Rosenberg, from putting it in. So it didn't actually happen. The priest admits that, okay? Uh, and in the documentary, In Search Of, the priest explains, I was blessing the sewing room. It was freezing. It was a beautiful day outside, and granted, it was winter, but that level of coldness made little sense, given the other circumstances. He thought that was pretty strange. And when he says he heard a really powerful voice shouting, Get out! You knew it was coming that time, didn't you? I, I couldn't resist putting it in, I'm really sorry. Uh, did it scare you the second time? I don't know. At the time, the priest says he was dousing the place with holy water, and then this invisible thing came from behind and slapped him in the face. Later on, after the documentary, it was established that the priest was a guy called Father Ralph Pecoraro, who's now deceased. His story becomes clouded in controversy during the Lutz vs. Weber trial, when he contradicted himself over his relationship with the Lutz family. This Father Pecoraro, or Father Mancuso, said in an affidavit that he'd only spoken to the Lutzes on the subject via phone, so he actually didn't visit. And then there's other stories that say he did visit, but he had no odd experiences there. So what do you believe? And then the kind of, after the Lutzes left, the next part was the so-called investigations. This is before the book's written. So uh, many investigations, and after the book was written, to be fair, many investigations were held to get to the bottom of the Amityville horror, and they fall into two distinct types. The first, paranormal investigations, and appearances by George Lutz, where he produces photographs to shore up his claims of demonic activity, and then countless secondary documentaries, films, YouTubes, Reddit discussions, where people don't produce any additional evidence, but they simply pick apart the existing evidence and conclude that it was all either true or a massive hoax, and that seems to depend on what they believed before they started their investigation. The Amityville horror book and movies. So the family's 45 hours of taped interviews served as the foundation for Anson's 77 book, which was published by Prentice Hall in September 1977. And the book has sold 155,000 copies. And then if you look at book clubs and other sales, it brings the total sales of the book to around 400,000. That's not nothing. Uh, that's a lot of money. Anson himself said, um, quote, I have no idea whether the book is true or not, but I'm sure that the Lutzes believe what they told me to be true. Well, he's ever the diplomat, isn't he, there? Anson admitted that the Lutzes got a cut of the book sales, but he wasn't allowed by his publishers to disclose at that time of the interview uh, how much. Um, some people say that the book and its successful spin-off earned the family about $300,000. Uh, they themselves, the Lutzes, claim never to have entered into a contract with Anson. They may have been splitting hairs there because they possibly entered into a contract with the publishers because how else would they get paid otherwise? So, you know, mm, there's lies, lies and being economical with the truth. Because later on, George Lutz acknowledged uh, receiving $100,000 from the book and an additional $100,000 from the movie when he testified in a case in a federal court in Brooklyn. And that's interesting because when I was doing my research for the article, I found a um, Washington Post article, which says he was denied the money from the uh, movie sales. So that clearly isn't true. This, again, what is true here? Um, after the Lutzes, to work out whether they did profit from it, after the Lutzes left Amityville, they moved to the other side of the country, and they rented a $100,000 home in uh, close to San Diego. And, but they claimed that they got 50% of the proceeds, but they claimed it all went to pay attorneys and past due bills. They, they were so litigious 
Um, there were so many court cases. As I said, it's all about where money is. Lawyers come sniffing around. I'm sorry if you're a lawyer. Not all lawyers are like this. Some people do gallant work, um, making sure bad people get put behind bars and protecting the innocent. But some people, um, some lawyers run after money, particularly media lawyers and Hollywood lawyers and things like that, and publishing lawyers. But what do I know about it? I don't know anything, so I'll just shut up about that. So Jay Anson said, um, my, this is a quote from him, my doing the Amityville horror was a fluke. George Lutz, this at the time, he said, has a friend, obviously they're all dead now, who lives in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, the town where Prentice Hall, the publishers, is located. The friend walked into the publishing house and asked how one goes about getting a book published. What kind of book, they asked. And when he said it was a ghost story, he was sent to Tam Mossman, who specialised in the occult. Tam listened to the story, called me, that's Jay Anson on the phone, we've been best friends for several years, and said he wanted me to meet the Lutzes. Anson says, I listened to their story, I thought it was a hell of a ghost story. George, on his own, had told his story on 35 hours of tapes already. He prepared this before hand so he must have known what he was going for before he even got the publishing deal or even got Jay Anson to write the story and then this idea that he wouldn't get a cut from that he's basically done tons of the work nobody would expect to do tons of the work and not get a cut so this guy did not tell the truth a lot um in any case he gave the 35 hours of tape that he'd already done to Jay Anson and Anson says he interviewed him for an additional five hours to get the chronology of what he told me straight in, in my head I spent another several hours interviewing some cops in Amityville, the priest who blessed the house, whose name I falsified at his request, by the way, some of the Amityville Historical Society people. Then, on a couple of sheets of yellow paper, I wrote down a few words to remind me what they had done and said and experienced on each of the days they lived in the house. So the 1979 movie, The Amityville Horror, made $7,843,467 in 1979, the first weekend it opened, that is the first weekend, okay? It was the most successful independent movie there had ever been. It was directed by Stuart Rosenberg. Now, Stuart Rosenberg in, I think, 67, had directed Cool Hand Luke and was noted for his work with Paul Newman. So this was a guy who knew success. People obviously realized that this was gonna be a seller. And I think George Lutz, all the preparations that he made, inviting the priest very early on, I kind of think he did come early on, um, or maybe he spoke on the phone, but anyway, got in touch with the priest. Then concocting all these stories, which uh, um, his stepson doesn't believe or doesn't remember, and um, then producing, before he even speaks to a writer, 35 hours of tape, come on. Anyway, um, the story goes that Samuel Z. Arkoff, or Z as we would say, bought the rights to Janssen's books and he asked Janssen first of all to do the screenplay but Arkoff didn't like it and rejected it and he got a screenwriter called Sandor Stern who wrote it as a completely new story. Now, so the book came out in 77, the, um, the movie came out in 79, Janssen was interviewed about this and he, this is where I get these quotes from and he, he'd already had a heart attack and he was writing the book when he had a heart attack. And then he died in 1980, age 58, of a heart attack. So he only, he only, there was only a year. So I don't know how much either he enjoyed the profits of this. I, I don't believe it was a curse, being honest with you. But there are 21 films on the Amityville horror. The movies cover the years through 1979 through to the present, pretty much up to the present. Only four of these movies saw widespread exposure in theatres. The rest of them, and that was the Amityville Horror 79, Amityville 2, The Possession, Amityville 3D, which sounds like a, a classy film, and then the Amityville Horror 2005, and most of the movies of the 21 went straight to video. So let's say about the investigations after, this is kind of the next part. So the the, the, the DeFeo's murdered his family, the Lutzes have, have had their experiences or what. Uh, Anson's written his book, and the film is in production, it's, you know, this is all lined up. And then the Warrens come in. Now, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, were probably the two most renowned paranormal researchers of the previous century. That is the 20th century, in case you've forgotten, we're in the 21st. So the Warrens were a husband and wife team. 
And they were involved in some of the most well-known purported hauntings in historical times, such as the Amityville Horror, of course, and the Enfield Poltergeist, which I've also written about. Their fame and reputation in this area lent support to George Lutz's claims of weird goings on at Amityville, because if you believe that these things happen, you're probably inclined to believe the bona fides of the Warrens because um, they spent a lot of time and established a lot of authority in this area. So Ed Warren, a self-taught demonologist, and Lorraine Warren, a light trance medium. Now, I don't know how you actually get those jobs. I never seen them advertised, and I don't know about any college courses to train you as that, but they're impressive titles. They formed the New England Society for Psychic Research, the first paranormal investigation organization in New England. Numerous movies, TV shows, and documentaries, including The Conjuring and the Annabelle franchises, were inspired by the Warrens, who were amongst the first investigators into the Amityville haunting. There's a ton of money involved in that. In the house, the Warrens held a seance during which they captured a photograph of a demonic boy who, remarkably, resembled one of their photographer's own children. Professional photographer Gene Campbell set up an autonomous camera to capture infrared black and white images at night, and guess what? You've got a picture of his son. I mean, uh, of the demonic boy. Believers said that the ghost resembles John DeFeo, the younger of the two DeFeo boys who were killed in the house. Um, and there's another ghost photo, and some people think that this is Paul Bartz, an investigator working with the Warrens that night, is the person in the ghost. He has these uh, white eyes, but they, they reckon it's because it's an infrared film. And then three years later, this, in 79, the same year that the original film was released, George Lutz unveiled an image on the Merv Griffin show, and this was said to have been taken in 1976, while Ed and Lorraine Warren and their team were examining the house. So why didn't he bring it out then? Mm. So many people have questioned this, why the photograph wasn't made public sooner, and it led to rumours that the photograph was fabricated, could you believe, to promote the book that George Lutz was writing, which also had the photograph in it. Now, in the 2012 documentary film, My Amityville Horror, I don't know what that sounds like. My, I can't even think. My my Beautiful Romance, My Beautiful Laundrette, that was a film came out about that time, it was a nice film. Uh, anyway, My Amityville Horror centers on Daniel Lutz's account, the son, because the others have all passed away by now, regarding the Lutz's family stay at 112 Ocean Avenue. And this documentary, 2012, features Lorraine Warren herself because her husband, Ed, was dead by this time. And anyone who has seen the scenario will not soon forget it, in which Warren prays with Daniel Lutz and exhibits a piece of the cross. She claims it was the true cross that Jesus Christ actually died on. And she has a box holding hairs from St. Pius of Pietrocina. So these are holy relics that old Lorraine Warren has. When asked about the Amityville thing, Lorraine is quoted as saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to refrain from doing the accent. Amityville was horrible, honey. It was absolutely horrible. It followed us across the country. I don't even like to talk about it. I will never go into the Amityville house ever again. You don't know how long my career is, and that's the only one. The very first night that Ed and I went into that home, I was fearful, but I didn't know what I was fearful of. World-renowned clairvoyant Lorraine Warren said of her maiden trip inside the Amityville Horror House. As I was going up the stairs, I reached the point where it felt as if a force of water was coming against my chest, almost like a waterfall. She said, explaining her initial feeling inside the haunted home, it was the worst feeling. I stopped on the landing and held tight to the relic that was in my hand and asked for strength and direction in going forward. It felt ominous to me. Mm, certainly did. It felt ominous to a lot of people. And then that isn't even the end of all this contentious stuff. There's a guy called William Weber, 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 I guess, in German, although he's probably American-German, was the lawyer for Ronald DeFeo, the guy, as you remembered, uh, convicted of murdering his family at the house. This Weber, a Weber, DeFeo Jr.'s lawyer, apparently admitted that the whole haunting was a scam, that he, uh, he says in this admission, he allegedly concocted with Anson, the author, while intoxicated. Anson doesn't say this. Weber says that the story was made up to help Roland DeFeo's appeal against his sentence. And I'm like, what? So it's difficult to know how this would work, as it only took 12 days to get from the crime to the conviction. And after spewing out a bunch of alternatives, Ronald DeFeo admitted the murder. So that seems pretty bang to rights, as we say. Um, I guess the plan might have arisen because after DeFeo admitted he'd done it, 
and he admitted he wasn't insane and there was no voices, the only reasonable defence, I use that word advisedly, reasonable, was that the pig-headed demon made him do it. But you know, it's a stretch. Uh, but apparently, in order to carry out the plan to free DeFeo, Weber is supposed to have teamed up with Anson and the Lutz family, who were the next residents of 112 Ocean Avenue, as you know. According to William Weber, I was aware that this book is a fraud. We came up with this horror story after several glasses of wine. So Weber allegedly met with George and Kathy Lutz when they, when they talked about what would eventually form the plot of Anson's books. And I guess the chronology of this must be then that uh, this is the time when George Lutz is starting to tape his account. So DeFeo has gone to jail a year before. He's serving 25 years. His attorney is, is kind of working on some plan to uh, free him, gets involved with the Lutzes, looks him up because they've moved into the house and says, I tell you what, let's say there's a pig-headed demon made him do it, made my client do it. That should get him off. They have a couple of drinks. Brilliant idea. George Lutz says, right, I'll, get, I'll start taping. 35 hours of testimony. Wow. Okay. So, it, you know, and Weber must have been confident that when he phoned the Lutzes, they would go, sure, that's a brilliant idea. It would just say the house is um, haunted by a demon and that'll get him off and yeah, don't thank us. Well, maybe they had an eye to the money. Maybe that's what it was about. But remember, Anson's supposed to be in this as well. So Weber must have got the, the, the Lutz family, or at least the parents, the two, Kathy and uh, George, and Jay Anson to play along with this plan to free DeFeo and keep quiet about it and not admit it was all made up, you know? Um, or, you know, why would he do this? Uh, it clearly didn't work. How is DeFeo going to pay Weber for this? He's, he's not a millionaire. He's a down at heel broke delinquent. So maybe Weber did it just for the laugh. Or this whole story that he told, it, and he's an attorney, remember, is a lie. And maybe, just maybe, because he wrote a book about the case as well, maybe it was just to publicise that. Who knows? I don't want to get sued. I don't know if they're all still alive. But I'm not saying anything, obviously. But, um, you know, one wonders... So later on, lots of details in the official George Lutz story were challenged. So his researchers called Rick Moran and Peter Jordan disproved that there were cloven hoof impressions on the snow on January 1st, 76, as when they looked, there hadn't been any snow on that day. The other story was that, um, that the local Shinnecock Indians of the area formally abandoned the insane and dying on the site that became the Amityville Horror House, and that appears to be baloney. And the, the local Native Americans have just said, you know, that's just rubbish. It's not true. And in the book and 79 movie, and Anson talks about interviewing the police, but the record showed that the police were never actually called to the, the Lutzes never called the police when they were living at Ocean Avenue. And the neighbours, for what it's worth, said, you know, while they were there, they had no idea that anything was happening at all. There was no signs of anything weird going on. It's just a normal kind of nice area of uh, Long Island. And then... So what happened to the house after the Lutzes? Fair question. So after the Lutz family left the home in 1976, the different owners, all of them, have publicly stated that there have been no issues. The home's next owner, James Cromarty, and his wife, Barbara, who purchased it in 1977, spent 10 years living there. And they remarked that nothing strange ever happened except for people coming by because of the book and movie. So Jim and Barbara Cr Cromarty, or Cromarty, who purchased the house in March 77 for 55,000. So that's about 30, nearly 30,000 less or 25,000 less than the um, uh, Lutzes bought it. And they got it much cheaper than it should have been. So it was a real bargain. It was said that there was damage in the book, that the locks and everything were all smashed up. And Barbara Camati said that wasn't right. There was no signs of any physical damage to the locks, doors and windows. And that they, these were the original fittings that hadn't been replaced. And then it was said, you know, this famous red room at the bottom of the house. They said, the Cromarty said, that the, the Lutzes would have been aware of this red room because it wasn't camouflaged in any manner whatsoever. And it was a small closet in the basement. That's all it was. So, in conclusion, what do I think? What's true and what's not? So I think that George Lutz half convinced himself that the hauntings of Amityville House were real and he ignored the part of his mind that reminded him he'd made it up. He did that because he liked the theatre of it all, he liked the fame, and he liked the $100,000 plus that it eventually earned him. And everybody else who was involved in it, it suited them not to ask too many tough questions about the truth of it. Jay Anson, as we've seen the author, 
um, Stuart Rosenberg, the producer and the director and the producer of the movie, and everybody else who ever made a cent out of Amityville, they suited them to, you know, because if you say it's all rubbish, you're not going to sell anything. So it suited their bank balances. And we're all human, aren't we? We've got to make a living. Um, not to question the truth of George Lutz's far-fetched story. However, on the other hand, George and Kathy Lutz completed a lie detector to back up their claims. And it was successful. It was carried out by very reputable people. And it appeared when they talked about the pig-headed demon of Amityville, they were telling the truth, or at least they thought they were. And then Daniel Lutz's son, who now lives in Queens, claims that the 28 days he spent in the Amityville house are still haunting him. So maybe the Lutzes are telling the truth. Get out!